Welcome to Live Breathe Film, episode 77. It's been a while, but you're still here with Corey, Doug, and Murph. Thank you for joining us. Today we're going to talk about our most anticipated films and TV shows of 2023 and share our thoughts on Avatar, The Way of Water, and its tremendous box office take so far. Once again, never bet against James Cameron, folks. So, where we're currently at through Janu- the weekend of January 8th is um, Avatar's Behemoth. It's at 1.7 billion worldwide, which gives it the which makes it the number seven film of all time. Uh, 1.2 billion of which is international box office growth or gross, so it's the fifth biggest movie internationally. And then 521 million domestic. Uh, which makes it 16 um, all time. So all of those of which are going to continue to go up in the months to come as it continues to hold um, sway over the premium theaters. You got an extension in China, um, a 30 day extension over their holiday season. So uh, what are we thinking? Um, First of all, are we surprised at how much it did so far? Um, how far do we expect it to go at this point? Um, I wouldn't necessarily say I'm surprised, I guess. But the way that I think I'm surprised about how quickly it started to pick up, pick up steam. Like once it wasn't even that like once it released, it, it was kind of a slow, like a slow build up, And then all of a sudden, I guess the holidays came and then it started to really generate uh, a lot of revenue. That's what was surprising to me, that it picked up as much speed as it did so quickly. Yeah, it's been a little uh, a little different than the trajectory of the first Avatar. I mean, its opening was about double, um, at least domestically, uh, but it did have a lot of factors against it. Um, there was a lot of really bad weather. The fact that the movie was super long, and it is right before the holidays, uh, it doesn't have that rush out factor like the MCU and uh, Star Wars films where people are worried about spoilers. Um, I feel like this movie was, it's just generally more of a general audience spectacle where people are people are also trying to get tickets in the best theater possible and the best seats possible. So I know like there were a ton of pre-sales that were made prior to it coming out, but it wasn't necessarily for opening weekend but later on throughout the holidays. And I think we're still going to continue to see plenty of people trying to get the best seats and the best theater available in uh, the weeks to come. Yeah, I mean, I still haven't seen it a second time for partly that reason, because my seats that I were I was able to get the two times that I got tickets weren't great. And then as it got closer, I was just like, eh, I'll wait. Wait for better seats. What, uh, what way did everyone see it in? Uh, IMAX 3D. I think we all. Yeah, IMAX. I saw you, it in IMAX 3D. Uh, not you like did. true IMAX, like Limax 3D. Okay. Yeah, I saw it in <laughs> Limax 3D and Dolby Cinema 3D. Um, in my experience, I thought the Dolby 3D um, looked a little better. I'm not sure if it had the high frame rate or not, but it did seem like it was a little less like laggy at points. Uh, which was something I thought when I saw it first in IMAX. Um, It just felt like in certain action scenes and uh, scenes involving the water, like things were going a little bit slower than I would have expected. Um, I don't know if Corey or Doug, you felt that way at all? It's like a screen door effect. I think that's like with the 3D. Um, But I think, I, I don't think it's in high... It's in a higher frame rate in anything but IMAX 3D. I don't know. No, I, if it was in IMAX 3D, I didn't. I didn't notice a higher frame rate. Yeah, I thought it was in a higher frame rate in Dolby and not IMAX. Um, oh, in IMAX, I thought it was definitely like a smoother. It, it reminded me exactly like what they did with the original Avatar re-release. Like okay. it was a faster yeah. frame rate. But I think a lot of it also is because it was in 3D. Like, it just looked different. 
Yeah. Either way, I thought like uh, the, Dol crisp. the Dolby picture was nicer. Um, Definitely. Colors were better, sure. everything like that. IMAX has better sound. Dolby, better picture. Um, yeah. And IMAX, bigger screen. So um, they both have their pros and cons. But um, yeah, I mean, as far as Doug, you drafted Avatar. Um, yeah, I mean, I've been, second I've been all about, yeah. I've been saying Avatar is coming, you know, like the guy on the street saying the world's going to end for a while now, saying like this movie's going to be big. So, I mean, it's, I'm glad to see that it's doing well. I, I think it's interesting. Box office is interesting because domestic still isn't crazy mm -hmm. high. I mean, it, we're, what, we're in the 500 millions. Yeah. So it'll be interesting to see whether or not we'll have enough legs to top Top Gun. But it doesn't. I don't know. I don't think it's going to top Top Gun. I think it yeah. may get close, but I don't think it's as leggy. I don't think it's going to be leggy enough to take out Top Gun for domestic box office. Yeah, I think that the highest it gets is topping Top Gun, in my opinion. Um, yeah. It'll be around that Top Gun Maverick, Black Panther, like that 700 million area, like high 600s. Low seven hundreds, um, yeah. unless it legs out like crazy over the next two weeks, um, in which case it can potentially get up to the, the first avatar. But really, it's international. That just is mind boggling. Yeah, international, I mean, yeah, is, is going crazy. Cameron now has um, three of the top five films released internationally. It's soon to be three of the top four because it's going to top Avengers: Infinity War, like in the next like week or so uh, probably even like days um as far as worldwide i think when he had said this needs to be one of the top like four movies of all time <laughs> even, and it's probably gonna end up being around number four uh i mean i don't i can't see it getting as high as avatar or endgame maybe it can get to three um no one honestly, can like anything, honestly, 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 everything I've listened to on the James Cameron quote has been like no one can understand how that makes sense. Oh, he made up budget. his own. He made up his own. Yeah. Uh, I think he was just trying to get fuck like um, buzz out there on the movie and just yeah make he it had, seem make it seem like clickbait and like to get people to read. Yeah, the Avatar. people are like maybe is he counting the second movie too or like the third movie? And yeah. Stuff? Like, what is he counting to get to this number? Exactly. Um, because I heard it broke even like a week ago and it wasn't at two billion yet or anything like that. Like once it hit like one point five, I think one point four, they were like, Okay, the movie is like all profit at this point. Um Which that even seems too high. Like one point five billion is your break even. Well, I mean, movies with water are expensive. Like Pirates of the Caribbean 4 was $400 million, and you got to go yeah. through three times as much of the budget um, <clears throat> to be at that break even point. So that to me seemed like more of a realistic number. Like that Avatar 2 would be four, like cost $450. Um, so it would need something like $14, um, $1.4 billion to break even. Uh, but yeah, I mean, honestly, I could see it somehow becoming the biggest movie of all time, be just because shit's it's just crazy. You, you can't bet against this guy. He just knows what international audiences like. Uh, they're not cla like the Avatar movies aren't like I don't know, they're not great movies. Like, in my opinion, Titanic is like a great movie, but and The Way of Water I thought was substantial substantially better than the uh -huh. first avatar but yeah. i wouldn't say like it's great like it doesn't necessarily make the most sense that it's like becoming as big as it is i mean other than the fact that it feels like a one in a con one of a kind thing like an immersive experience that you're not going to get even in the mcu um or anything like that yeah i mean it's the theater has become a place where because I think home entertainment, and we've talked about this before, because home entertainment is just 
so good at this point. Like I can watch a 4K movie on my big screen TV from the comfort of my couch. It's hard to justify for a lot of people going out to the theater. But like to go see Avatar, like you need to see it in 3D. Like it's built for like a the spectacle event where you need to get, you're like really there's a lot of pressure to go to the theater to see to see this because you're not going to have the same experience yeah. from your couch. And I think that's I think that's what we're seeing is this this is a movie that is being sold to audiences as a you need to see this in theaters. And so. I mean, people are people are responding. People are respond. Yeah, they're responding. Yeah, he said exactly what I was thinking. Um, as the only person, not only so Corey passed up um, Avatar to take Black Panther, Wakanda Forever in the draft. We we were all like kind of like, which, which is it going to be? Um, Avatar is it going to end up making two hundred, three hundred million more in the U.S. But that's besides the point. Um, Doug, you were the only person last year and when we did, or yeah, in the beginning of 2022, when we did our most anticipated films of the year, not only to have it in your top 10, but to have it ranked number two. Mm. Um, so it was your second most anticipated movie of the year. You've been hyped for a while now. Um, yeah. Corey and I didn't have it in our top 10 or anything like that. Um, <laughs> I got more hyped as the year went along, as the re-release came out, and I enjoyed it more. Um, but, uh, as the person most anticipating the film, what did you ultimately think about it? I was actually really pleasantly surprised with it. I think, um, are we, are we going right into our review or do you want me to just yeah, give, talk, like, high level talk, thoughts? Talk, okay. Talk about, you talk about the film in depth. Okay. Yeah. So I was actually pretty happy, happy, happy with the movie overall. It did more than I expected it to do on providing a more compelling, Although very generic story still, I, I thought this was a more interesting generic story. Going back and, and watching the first Avatar, really like I saw a lot a lot more of the flaws of the first movie than I think I noticed the the first time around when I saw it. Like like we've talked about like uh, Jake Sully is like the most generic character in the world. The villains are very generic. Um, I mean everything is just super 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 super, super generic the, the line so, the line reading is cheesy like yeah it's just like so, so i think the second movie improved and a lot i thought that there was the villain was more compelling although it was the same villain <laughs> he was much <laughs> more mean, interesting he was as, much more interesting as, as a as yes. an, yeah having having an avatar an and i just thought they they did more to make him more of just like generic bad guy they tried to give him a little bit more depth yeah where like he had a son he's now appreciating the the ways of the Navi the culture and yeah you could the see culture that and everything he's gonna expand and grow even more as this yeah so i thought on. yeah i mean probably gonna become a protagonist at some point in time since we have five movies i mean Cam <laughs> this cameron be... cameron's done it already where he's turned the villain into the hero that's true where, yeah so terminator great. Yeah, so it can totally happen again. He that may be what we're seeing is he's just gonna turn it into like he's the good guy now. Um, but and maybe the Avatar. It's not the Jake Sully story. It's really the uh, general whatever the hell his name is story. Yeah, about how he transforms into this like commander of the Avatar or whatever or the Navi. So. Um, yeah, I, th I thought that was an improvement. I thought the story overall was just more interesting. I think the family dynamic gave the characters a lot more depth because you got to see Jake as a father figure. Um, he was in the movie, I think, less, but somehow he was more interesting and he it was, was more impactful. Yeah, less was more with Jake, like a lot. Yeah, more. I he thought also, Sam Worthington was a lot better in this yeah. movie. I think they yeah, did I did too. A little bit better too like his character was less wooden yeah i thought um god why am i blanking on her name who plays in the teary zoe saldana. zoe saldana zoe saldana i thought she was really really i thought her performance was really really good she just wasn't um, in enough of it that was my only great but I, I liked like her her scenes where she had to like react as a as a grieving mother Yes, that like, was her, I thought her she highlights. completely sold 
Yeah, but I thought her performance completely sold. Like, the fact that, like, I completely bought into the fact that she was a grieving mother and that, you know, when she just fucking goes ape shit on everybody, which to me is like one of the best parts of the movie, mm-hmm. is when she's just like, fuck everybody, I'm just gonna start shooting arrows and killing a bunch of people. Like, I was like, hell yeah, this is awesome. Yeah. Um,. So I thought I like Zoe Saldana. Sald- Zoe Saldana's performance a lot. I thought she had some interesting things to do. Um, I I just think this movie was an improvement. Not almost. I mean, the the visuals are, are of course better because time the technology's gotten better. But I thought this movie was an improvement on probably almost every way to the first one, which is I mean, pretty good for a sequel. Um, yeah. I. I haven't seen this movie twice like you have, Murph. I really would like to see it. Um, but I don't... I'm hoping I have time. I mean, I guess I will have time. It should be in the theaters for the next couple of months. So hopefully I can go back and see it. But I, it will, I just... It'll still be in theaters in March. I really enjoyed it. I would say the first half, there was stuff that kind of dragged a little bit for me. That I think probably could have been cut or cleaned up a little bit. Where I was just like... Um, like it started to, I, I felt like I was starting to fade at times where I was just like, this is a lot of just like hanging out in the water <laughs> without a lot yeah. of happening. Yeah, um, that, probably it's interesting because some people enjoyed that aspect and yeah, I know some people did not. Corey, I know was one that he felt the same way. Um, but the water stuff drag, I didn't get that as much as you guys did. Um, but that's definitely something where people are mixed well like some people are like that's this is the best part about the movie it just looks so beautiful um others like yeah i mean we we could do it without a little bit of it i appreciated the visuals i just think like it would have it felt like to me like we were starting to pick up pace and then we just like we got to water area and it was just like complete stop it went right back i guess it it went back to world building once they got yeah, yeah so it was kind area. of like if you're yeah if you were looking at a roller coaster it kind of felt like we were going up that it stopped and then like an hour out from the movie when they start hunting the whale and the whole whale stuff it just like fucking goes off a cliff and it gets like insane it like starts moving at like crazy speed yeah mm-hmm. um so i think they probably could have done that build up and to the action maybe a little better but i would say like i was like this is a i'm enjoying this movie it's probably how I felt, and I was like, it probably wouldn't have made my top ten if it wasn't for that last hour, where I was just like, this last hour is awesome. Like it was one of those. Yeah, there's a couple of times where I've gone to a theater where I'm just like, this is bananas. This is awesome. Like, holy shit. Um, Avengers Endgame. You know that final battle scene is one of those times. I I had that feeling. I had a similar feeling, although you know there was not probably not quite as strong as Avengers Endgame, but I had a similar feeling where I was like, holy shit, like, what am I, what am I watching? This is, this is like something I my like unexpected almost that I'm yeah. seeing like this type of action taking and place. The difference with Avengers Endgame is there were so many, the build up, build, the build up was so long. This while yeah. Yeah, it was 13 years since the previous installment, we weren't like anxiously awaiting it the way like, Marvel regularly was putting out product and getting you hyped for this concluding chapter. Like, wait till after five. I mean, if Cameron is correct, each move, each sequel is better than the previous one. Um, I don't doubt the guy at this point. He is batting yeah. a thousand <laughs> the sequels um, between Aliens, Terminator 2, and The Way of Water. And man, the biggest difference for me between the first and second installment was probably the fact that the final action scene was so much more exciting than the final action scene in the original one. Um, Like that last hour, like in general, Um, in addition to everything else that you said, because it really did level up in every way. Um, All the the kids, the whole family, way more interesting. Uh, The plot initially moved a lot quicker. Um, it got us through the forest scenes, gets us to the water 
area where then they're doing the world building for a bit and then gets us to the action. Um, and yeah, shout out, shout outs to Sam Worthington, Zoe Saldana. Um, I thought Sigourney Weaver did a fantastic job as a teenager. Um, what's, what's interesting about that. And I think I don't want to cut you off, but it, it's, I've talked to a lot of people. Like, of course, like we know a lot about, we follow all these movies. And so we're like pretty dialed in. And so like, we all knew that that was Sigourney Weaver playing like the teenager. And so like, I couldn't help but hear Sigourney Weaver and know that that was Sigourney Weaver's oh, voice. Yeah. Totally. But there's a lot of people I've talked to that, you know, aren't following that. And they had no idea that was Sigourney Weaver. Which is pretty impressive. It's a pretty, it's pretty crazy yeah. on her part. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and the fact it didn't detract from the movie for me. It, no. Like that I knew it was her. Um, it, mo it more impressed me. The fact that it wasn't bothering me. Um, she was the, one of the characters I found most interesting in the film and interested to see where they end up taking her um, since they kept the parentage um, a secret and I feel like that character is going to have a massive amount to do with the later chapters yeah it seems that way hopefully she's not too overpowered yeah I mean I don't want her to be like Neo or something or like just like the one who's destined to um which i it seems they're likely yeah that probably will end up being the type of situation <laughs> because cameron goes with the obvious he's just gonna make it well executed um where it's not gonna be annoying even though it was foreshadowed and obvious but uh yeah overall i the fact that I went out of the first Avatar like completely blah about it, um, pissed off at, at all its like award nominations back in 2009, 2010, the fact that it made as much money as it did, he's turned me around on this series. Um, and I think the third one has like, this one you could just go balls to the wall, like you, yeah, because it seems like the setting is still probably going to be in a similar area. Um, based on the end of the film, um, there's no reason why you can't just go straight into more action. And from what I've heard, which sounds pretty exciting, is they're going to introduce more. Um, since the there it hasn't been very complex so far with who's good and who's bad. It's been Navi are good, humans are bad. Now, according to James Cameron, we're going to be getting some bad Navi in the third one and some. Mm -hmm. Good humans. I read that too. But the the ash people, so, right? Yeah, yeah, the fire, yeah, not the fire. Yeah, the ash so people. That's pretty. That'll make things even a little more exciting. That there's going to be some shades of gray, and not everything being just so black and white. It might hurt the box office, but um, it might end up being like a breakout sequel because people are now like so into Avatar, and now they're getting one just two years later, which is what people are used to when with most franchises um so who knows what will happen in two years and COVID will be less of an issue hopefully in two years because it should have made a lot more money in china based on how much the first mm -hmm. one did um yeah although well, china seems to be very much on supporting its own movies these days versus they are yeah back then when you know they were going out to see a lot of more american movies so yeah I don't know if like the the appetite has kind of changed a little bit in that country for the people there. Mm -hmm. um, Corey, I think you were the the least um, enthusiastic about the film, mostly because it is like feels like a theme park ride more than anything else, or the fact that it is so non non original. I mean, it's a it, it's original in certain ways. Um, but then it cribs a lot from other types of stories. Yeah, I think, um, I think it's very interesting how I feel about it because I'm kind of conflicted. Like I did really like it. Like I'm, and I I enjoyed everything that you guys pointed out. Sorry, my headphones are. Everything that you guys pointed out, I agree with, um, except for probably Sigourney Weaver. I'm kind of lukewarm, but 
again, I think it's kind of a situation where I need to see it one more time to really gauge how I feel about a lot of the things. Um, I, the biggest issue that I had with the movie was that it just was too long for no reason. Like it did not need to be as long as it was. And that, um, that's an issue for me because it's just like, how many times am I going to go back and watch this movie? Even if I did absolutely love it, like it's just so long. And a lot of it is just eye candy. Like there's that 45 minute hour long period in the middle of the movie where it's just, there's no real progression. It's just, you know, eye candy, which is fine. You know, it's just not something that really grabbed me for the most part. Like after the, like, 10 or 15 minutes of them being in the water, the effect kind of wore off for me. Like I wanted more of the story that he was telling like that actually surprisingly for how generic that it was, like it did grab me this time. Um, I thought it was interesting how he, you know, expanded the world and I wanted more of it. I didn't want like to just sit there and just marinate in, you know, with the whales and in the water and stuff, like give me more stuff. More content. So you want mo more content in less time? I just want the story to continue going, and it just it it really yeah, went to I a snail's pace. It it, it kind of stopped for me. Like there was no there was no progression for like that forty five minutes with what the story was trying to, you know, convey. Mm. It was very little. You got to see it a second time. There is some a lot that happens during that second hour a lot of it's more character building like the like the outsiders connecting with the outsiders being their family connecting with the water the teenage water group or whatever learning about the whole whale thing it's fucking just i, I don't know all these names <laughs> It's, I don't know. What are the whales called? I, 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 tell you. I forgot. But, but, yeah, no, I get it. It's a lot of it wasn't the character development. I enjoyed, but like it was the, it was the sections of the film that just had, I guess it was world building and them exploring. And that, that was good for, for me for a little while, but then I thought it dragged on maybe like 20 minutes too more, too long or half hour too long. But again, I, I need to, I need to go back and see it one more time. I did enjoy it. I'd probably give it eight at a at a ten at this point. Um, but I don't know if it might go up after seeing it a second time. I'm excited for the they third were, one. Yeah, I thought they did a good job of making like it's bef with after the first one it was like I don't really know that there's much more story to tell here. And the second one they were like at the end they were like, guess what? There's more. We you know we're we're teeing this up better for sequels because. Yeah, I guess there's actually yeah. a sequels plan this time. Well, they do at a... the end of the first one. They do, they do, or Jake does say like they will eventually come back. Or Giovanni Rubisi says like this isn't like, oh, you think this is over or something like that. Yeah, but um, it's like, but, but it was it wasn't as clear. This one ends with like we're gonna fight. Like, um, yeah, I'm coming for you. Yeah, like don't fuck with us. Um, so yeah, it it was more. It, there, the ending made was, it clear there is going to be another one coming. Yeah, there was a couple of things that stood out to me in the movie that were kind of landed weird for me. The whales speaking, like actually talking and like having conversations with the people, I thought didn't work for me. <laughs> <laughs> I was just like, wait, what? The whales like talk. <laughs> To people like i don't know for some reason that uh, that just felt like kind of goofy when it was happening <laughs> um and then the other thing that is like i'm guessing it's going to be addressed in the sequels but like the whole like oh yeah the whale brain juice like stops aging yeah it'll definitely be addressed in the was, sequels. yeah but it like felt very you want obtaining the way they like introduced Supposedly, this like they're going to go to earth at some point in the series as well like, so that'll likely be part of that aspect. 
Yeah, you know, it's, it's so isn't like, even important anymore now. It's no, all the, now it's all about the whale juice. Yeah, the whale. What is it? It's they've given up on uh, brain fluid or something. Trying to save Earth and are now trying to get to Pandora and live long. Mm. They're at, they're just taking everything from Pandora to save humanity. Yeah. Um, I yeah, it just seemed like that was a kind of a. The way they dropped that fact for you just kind of felt like, wait, what? Yeah. <laughs> they're like, oh, yeah, it stops aging. And then they're just like, all right, moving on. And it's like, whoa, you, guys, you just you just said something very important. <laughs> and it, just, it just we're going to plant this seed for later yeah, on. Exactly. It was it. Exactly. But it also, you didn't even I think it. the other thing that felt <laughs> weird about it was that, like, there was this other character that didn't know the fact that this whale juice stopped aging. Like, which, he, one, which one was that? I think it was the, co- the commander guy. Right, he's the one that's being explained everything about the whales by the okay. whale hunter. Um, and okay, he's so like, oh, yeah, you know, like just explaining it. Okay. He, yeah. Yeah, I remember Jermaine, Jermaine Clement. Clement. Jermaine Clement was the one explaining things. Was he, he was he was the the nicer of the one? Yeah, that the was nice the, whale hunter guy. Yes. Yeah. The nicer whale hunter. But I feel like they were explaining it to another character. They were explaining it to. Uh, fucking quartage or quartage yeah yeah they were explaining to him um yeah yeah that's who i've been calling the commander guy because i couldn't remember his name it it also would make sense he wouldn't be aware of the situation because so many years have passed yeah since the last no i was totally fine with that what i wasn't fine with is like you tell me that very like interesting piece of information there's like no follow-up or anything it's just like all right yep stop staging cool like i'd be like wait what (laughs) there's there's I guess we'll find out. We'll more. It. So maybe if there was just like another so, to you, he was on a mission to kill Jake Sully. That's all he cared about. Maybe it, it was just we. I don't know. I, I didn't. I was okay with that seed being planted. It just was like it felt very. Uh, it didn't feel. It didn't feel very like delicately planted. It was kind of just like <laughs> lying to establish thing for a sequel. Yeah. Yeah, no, but by me, means this was not a perfect movie at all. Um, but it was just a... Uh, it was fun. It was a well-executed popcorn movie. Um, and it, as much as I said, like, it, it curbs from other things. Like, I was getting, like, Free Willy vibes at moments of this movie. Oh, yeah, 100%. Um, like, he, there's something about the early 90s movies that James Cameron... Kids movies that James Cameron keeps pulling into this Avatar series. Um but there is just so much originality to it. Like this mm-hmm. universe is one of the most like unique universes we've gotten in a long time um, outside yeah, of things that were adapted from books. Um, like, I guess, I don't know. I guess is, is it the most original sci-fi since Star Wars, like in world building? I probably would say yes. Maybe in world building. In story, definitely not. No, yeah, story, definitely not. Even Star Wars is not original. Star Wars yeah, is no, it's not. on pulp serials and yeah. things back in the day. Like, Archetypes. Yeah, like, like there's a lot of Star Wars that you can even look at Lord of the Rings and be like, all right, you pulled shit from Lord of the Rings mm-hmm. like in the way that each, how many, how so many of these characters act and things like that. Like when I saw Lord of the Rings in theaters, I hadn't read the books and I was like, oh, a lot of these characters I can like, point to and be like okay this is this person in star wars and that person in star wars um but yeah. i i think we're just more attuned to what what the familiar is compared to when we were kids and we first saw star wars mm-hmm. um, yeah i mean I, I don't think you're i think the world building is really interesting and they continue you know they continue to expand the world so that's all that's all good so as long as the story continues down the path of where it's interesting and the characters have interesting things to do. I don't know if we're doing another, I'm guessing we're not going to be doing another big time jump since he was very, at least not for the next movie. Cause I know Cameron the, was very keen big, on getting the, the kids big, stuff um, filled. Yeah. Or are you talking about time jump as far as when, how long it'll take for a sequel or a time jump as far no, as time jump within the world? Because we, we basically time jump. There was like going to be another one. We're getting a big time jump in the fourth movie. The fourth one. That's why yeah. they they filmed two, three, and a quarter of four. 
was so then they could do the time jump um, later in four after the kid characters have grown up. Like, you can't have, like, the spider kid, like, well, I mean, you can, but it'll just look a little ridiculous if he suddenly has a massive growth spurt and is um, yeah. still playing the same it makes age. sense. So, yeah, we are going to get another jump. I just don't know how big that jump is going to be. Yeah, I think, I mean, it definitely was a success, at least I think, I mean, for me, because probably you, you guys agree. I mean, the first one, we were enjoyed it. Doug really liked it, but, you know, it was okay. And this one kind of just pulled us in even more. And now we're like, you know, pretty interested to see where it goes. So that's a success. Yeah. For so sure. We'll see if it makes uh, any of our top 10 lists when we go over those on our next episode or um, an upcoming episode if it's not the next one. But uh, we'll also continue to track that box office. Um, but. Yeah, I think at this point uh, we're probably ending up in a situation where the fall box office pool is myself in first place, Doug in second place, and Corey in third place, um, even despite the fact that Corey had the best overall draft. Um, Doug is entirely reliant on Avatar. Um, it's carrying him. Yeah. <laughs> um, I had the benefit of my movies being double the gross, um, although I was pretty happy. And, I was pretty happy with what I drafted overall and the fact that I had one last movie than you because one of them was pushed to next mm-hmm. year. But um, Yeah, I thought about it. I mean, I, I know there's talk about like doubling wasn't the best solution, but I mean, anyone could have won even with the doubling. I mean, you if I would have picked a couple of better, if I would have made a couple of better choices, I could have, I could have easily been number one. If Corey would have taken Avatar instead of Black Panther, Corey could have... Could yeah, have, Corey could have won. Yeah, so, I mean, it, it, very cl- it was very close, um, despite like what the numbers are. Um, I thought this was the most exciting of all of them, as far as any of us really could have win one if just like one little change happened um, for all three of us. Um, so yeah, that was fun. But uh, well, that we'll draft for our spring our winter spring one pretty soon which we film discovering the period of uh february march and april um but what do you say we move on to more films and uh, that are coming out this year and talk about our most anticipated ones of 2023 cool all righty um so this was pretty interesting uh, because of COVID there were a bunch of movies that were on our most anticipated films of 2022 that did not come out uh, in 2022 that are still on our list in 2023 um, for there are some for various reasons, everything going on with DC. Um, I believe at least one of us has. Yep. Um, one of those movies that were pushed back. Um, due to all the crazy things going on at Warner Brothers. Uh, yeah, there's there's some movies that were originally supposed to be two-parters that are now its own thing. Um, so it's a very interesting eclectic list of films, um, despite there being some repeats. So let's start with um, Corey's number five pick. And it's one that is actually on all three of our lists. Um, and Corey, would you like to talk about Dune Part Two? Yeah. So um, the sequel to the original that came out. It's actually you know the split story, the second part that we're getting. Um, it feels like this movie came out forever ago. So I, I just cannot believe that we're at this point now where we're going to be getting this at the end of the year. Um, I'm really interested to see this because I've read the book before and the second half of the story, um, I think is going to surprise people, at least moviegoers that might not have read the book. Um, I think it's going to be, um, I think it's going to be huge. I think a lot of people are going to enjoy it and probably have a lot less negative things to say about it than what, a lot of people said that were valid about the first because of how it was split. Um, 
introduces a lot of new characters. So I think that um, it's gonna it's gonna really surprise a lot of people once it comes out. Which it's pro it seems like it's gonna be very faithful compared to what we've seen already to the subject material. Yeah, who do we got coming into the cast? We've got um, Florence Pugh, Austin Butler, Christopher Walken. Um, I feel like there's like at least one other big name joining the cast. I'm um, trying to. Ben today, I'll have a bigger role. She'll actually uh, be in the movie. Yeah, she'll actually be in the movie and not just the marketing. Um, I guess um, Javier Bardem will be back. Uh, Timothy Chalamet is back. Stone Skarsgård. I Leia Sado. Batista will have a bigger role. Oh, yeah, Leia Sado. She was the other one that yeah. I uh, wasn't thinking of. Um, so, nice. A lot of solid new additions replacing the characters that didn't make it past the first film. Um, yeah, the first one was one that I was, like, mildly, like, I was interested in seeing. I, I don't think it made my most anticipated of 2021 when we did that list um but the sheer but the director and the cast and the, the fact that the book is well praised had me excited i wasn't thrilled about the idea of it being split in two especially when they didn't have the second one greenlit uh, uh, but thankfully that did happen after its opening weekend it was a success um financially and critically acclaimed so uh yeah, that's why I um, ultimately included it in my top five. Yeah, I think it was a gamble. I mean, going going back and like, to me, I didn't realize this even until like we actually saw it that they were um, they they basically advertised the film as just Dune. You know? Yeah, it wasn't it wasn't yeah. Dune Part One yet? It was just Dune. Same and, with like, the same as it. Yeah. It wasn't until the credits, and then it said It Chapter 1 and Dune Part yeah. 1. Um, and you're like, what the fuck? <laughs> like, where was that in the marketing? It was just It and Dune. Yeah. Um, well, yeah, but it, it's a little different than Dune, and it feel, has like a it feels conclusion. Like a complete, it feels kind yeah, of... Yeah, it feels like a complete or, movie. It's a, Dune, it was an part 2 is like a flash Dune forward. Dune just stops. Dune is just like, oh, we're about to get to this really interesting middle part of the movie. Yeah. And and credits. <laughs> yep. And I, I I appreciate that that like um, the studio had you know the faith in the director where because I'm sure he was like I want to tell the you know as true a story as possible and this is really the only way we can do it like it needs to cut like this it's not going to be uh, you know that elegant I guess and we'll try but we're gonna need to do another movie like we can't do it all in one film and. I mean, it would have been terrible if the movie wasn't greenlit at the sequel. I would have been furious, but... That's why, like, it's hard to say this to me, <laughs> in my eyes, like, the studio had a ton of faith. They had, like... And, I guess... Yeah. They kind of hedged their bets yes. on that one. Yeah. They weren't 100% sure. They weren't willing to invest. Because they would have ultimately saved money had they shot the entire thing at once. Yeah. True. Um, true. So, I guess they just... They, they, they just listened to uh, Villeneuve. I guess Dune's box office paid. wasn't great, right? It, but it got because it was during COVID it's still simultaneous and, HBO Max release, sim the simultaneous release debacle. Yeah, uh, but I think if it was their biggest, it that yeah it was their biggest hit of that entire um, day and date release on HBO Max throughout the entire from Wonder Woman eighty four. Mm in late 2020 all the way through matrix um what the fuck was what was the matrix called again matrix uh, resurrections resurrections in yeah. the end of 2021 but uh okay uh doug and since you also had on your list anything you wanted to add about it um i mean at this point i just want to see how it i mean i want to see how it ends it's villa new it was a pretty looking film i like the music um, I'm ready to see, like, Corey keeps promising me the back half is going to be crazy. Yeah. So, But the thing is, he also has publicly stated he wants to adapt the second book also to make it a trilogy. Yes. And, like, and that would be, like, I mean, if it doesn't happen, it doesn't happen. At least we got the first book. I haven't read that it. book. I, I, I would read hope. That one yet. I would hope. His first one ultimately has a satisfying ending. Like, we wouldn't yes. need a follow-up if we didn't get one. 
Okay. So, it, third that would one. Be so terrible. Third one. <laughs> it like abruptly it, ends again. It, it's, yeah. The, it's like, oh, I needed the second book uh, in order to <laughs> yeah, satisfying it. Yeah, I mean, Dune is it, it's it's kind of its own thing. There's stuff that happens in the other in the the subsequent books, but from what I understand, it's it's. I mean, I remember from the first one, it's contained. So it's a contained story. Okay. It just kind of builds on it. Kind of, I guess, like Star Wars, like continues right. the story, okay. the world, universe, whatever. Um, Doug, your number five film was actually <laughs> on. It was number four for Corey in 2022, and number nine for you in 2022. Um, please talk so to us about up. the Flash. It has moved up, and it and it left the. Uh, Corey's list, I believe. Yeah, it's off Corey's yeah, list. Yeah, so actually, the, um, to me, this is more interesting of a movie than you know, like the other Marvel movie, which I don't know if any of us have on it on our list. Uh, we may not. Is a uh, so Quantum Mania is you know the one that's like, oh, this movie's crazy. It's got a lot of different things going on. Um, Flash is kind of what the my eyes a little bit of the DC counterpart to that. What's interesting about the flash is it's, it's part of the pre David Zasloff, pre new Warner brothers regime, old Zack Snyder stuff. And so it's, it's a part of the, the old DC vision that probably won't make its way into whatever, what James Gunn and team have planned for the new DC. Um, and it's got a actor that, you know, is, has been pretty, pretty uh tied up in controversy for the last couple of years um but it it's a movie that you know the rumors are that, that people have seen the test screening everyone says that this is a great movie um they they haven't shelved it there's been no move by warner brothers to you know to to, to get rid of this movie or sweep it under the carpet or anything like that so it seems like the studio has a lot of faith in this movie still um, so, I mean, just the signs for this movie point to it being good. I think um, Michael Keaton coming back as Batman is still really interesting. I'm still excited to see that. Mm -hmm. I think um, the Flashpoint story is a really good story. Um, I don't know if they're how faithfully they're going to adapt Flashpoint, but I think it's probably my favorite Flash story and one of my favorite DC stories. Um, it's a really interesting story for the Flash to take, and it's also a it's a reset story. So it's a way that uh, DC used to reboot their DC universe. So it could easily be a jumping off point for the DC universe if they just do a, a Flashpoint story. Um, I don't know. I, I, I think this is going to be... I wouldn't be surprised if this winds up being like one of my favorite movies that, this coming year just because of... It seems like it's got a lot going for it other than the fact that Ezra Miller has... you know. They've, they've been in a lot of trouble. They've been in a lot of trouble and probably won't be in any of the press. Yeah. Um, for this movie, I would guess. Uh, probably, you know, it'll probably be yeah, focused more on Michael Keaton. Yeah. There's been a lot. It seems like there's been a lot of it attempt at rehabilitation. So maybe mm -hmm. by June, yeah. that won't be so much of an issue. But I, yeah, I think they ultimately have to go Michael Keaton focused when it comes to marketing. And I mean, Michael Keaton is just. He's a great spokesperson for you because he's funny. He's everyone loves him. He's been around forever. And he's returning as fucking Batman. Yeah. Um, we haven't seen this yeah. since 1992. So, um, although his press is well, going to be like, I don't remember anything about this movie. It was a couple of years ago, and like yeah. <laughs> his like <laughs> press for Marvel stuff is always like, <laughs> he's like, oh yeah, I don't know. <laughs> Well, my, my back is my back is Batman or my Birdman? Which, which one am I? <laughs> <laughs> um, all right. Uh, but, my, yeah, I still would recommend if you haven't watched it, which I know you haven't. Still, DC. I, I'm gonna wait until after I see the movie to watch it. Did the Flashpoint story? Its ending is one of the. I love the ending to that movie. Um, there's an interesting twist on because it's like an alternate universe. You're talking about the anime? type of story, yeah. Well, just in the Flashpoint story, there's an alternate, there's yeah. an alternate story, and what they do with like some of the superhero characters, and some of the I, like I don't want to spoil it, but it's 
it's, it's cool. so good yeah and the way it ends is just top notch okay um my number five film was dune part two um so i will go into my number four um it actually appeared on my list at number three last year back when it was just <laughs> titled mission impossible seven uh now it is officially mission impossible dead reckoning part one um so as you are all aware i'm a huge fan of the mission impossible franchise have been since 1996 um the fact that it's turned into such a continuity based series um compared to the first few entry first well, four entries, which didn't so much, which had different directors every time and kind of just did its own thing, brought in new characters with the exception of Tom Cruise and Big Rames. Um, now it has like a steady roster of characters that are returning. Um, it has the same writer, director, and Christopher McQuarrie, uh, who also co wrote uh, Top Gun Maverick. Uh, this movie's guaranteed to have amazing. Um, action scenes that are just going to blow everyone's mind in IMAX, especially. But uh, yeah, the, really the only reason I dropped it from uh, what, three to four, was there's a couple movies above this that should have came out years ago, but were also the two movies that were delayed for various reasons that I'd been anticipating for a long time. But uh, we'll get to those in a little bit. Yeah, I mean, that's just outside of my top five. So I was also interested in seeing it. I mean, the fact that they do like that IMAX preview of that bike stunt, I mean, tells you it's going to be a pretty, there's going to be some pretty great stunts in that movie. Exactly. Uh, and they said they say they're still saving the best for eight. So we'll have uh, Dead Reckoning Part 2 to look forward to in 2024. That's where uh, they finally give Tom Cruise the stunt where he just like, he dies doing it. Uh, let's hope not. <laughs> but <laughs> um, it seems like they are visibly worried that he will die on one of these films that he makes because he is the foremost uh, acting slash stuntman in American films. Um, he's like the Jackie Chan of America. Um not in when it comes to martial arts or anything, but stunts. Um, all right. Uh, Doug, for your number four, you had Dune Part 2. We've already talked about that. So, Corey, let's get into your number four. Uh, so I went with Killers of the Flower Moon, which was definitely on my list last year. I just don't remember where it was, or I, I feel like it was. I have a list. It was number seven for you last year. Okay. So um, thought it was going to come out last year. And, you know, it hasn't at this point. So it's now 2023. It's Martin Scorsese's next uh, film. And it's a murder mystery uh, in the 1920s, I believe. Mm -hmm. I think that's when it takes place. Um, Leo, Leonardo DiCaprio's in it. Brendan Fraser, uh, Robert De Niro, um, Jesse Plemons. So, um, based on a book, haven't read the book, um, but I just, Scorsese always gets me. So I'm always looking forward to his, his next film. So this one is at the top of my list still. Yeah, this was in, it's on my top five as well. Um, Not to mention Leo being in it, of course. <laughs> yeah. Um, this was my number one pick last year, um, for going into 2022, um, it's an Apple slash Paramount um, co-production. Uh, I believe it will be in theaters via Paramount, and then it'll be on Apple TV Plus, I believe. Um, but it is getting a theatrical release, um, like a wider theatrical release, unlike The Irishman, which had a very limited one before going to Netflix. But yeah, I mean, the fact that you're getting, for the first time ever, Martin Scorsese's two muses in one film together in Robert De Niro... Um, and Leo, Leonardo DiCaprio is just, this is like something long awaited for. I mean, De Niro and, um, Scorsese's relationship goes all the way back to the mid seventies with, um, Mean Streets or early seventies 
all the way to them reuniting in the Irishman, which was a fantastic um, film, which could have been a Scorsese swan song. Mm-hmm. Um, but the man is still going strong. It's fucking awesome to see. And then Leo has been his muse for basically the 21st century, um, ever since Gangs of New York. So, uh, yeah, just the two of them on screen together in a Martin Scorsese picture has me so hyped. So that's why it, it uh, ultimately made my top five. And I'll, I'll get to where it ultimately ranked later. Um, all right, let's go to... Uh, Corey, we'll stick with your um, list. Um, talk about your number three film. Actually, wait. No, we'll go to we'll go back down to Doug. Your number three film. What, what was my number three film? <laughs> Doug, your number three film is Christopher Nolan's Oppenheimer. Okay, that's what I thought it was. Uh, yeah, so I I went with Oppenheimer primarily because it's a Christopher Nolan movie. And, you know, I, while I, I didn't love Tenet, um, I still have faith that Christopher Nolan's going to give me a good movie. Um, and Tenet wasn't by no means a bad movie. It just didn't live up to the hype that I had in my head. Um, I think going, veering away a little bit from sci-fi and seeing him, you know, cover a real, a real life person, a uh, person that, you know, create a weapon of such destruction and then ultimately regretted it is going to be an, probably an interesting character piece for him to do. Um, I've liked so far what I've seen visually uh, from the movie and I'm, um, haven't, I don't really recall the score, but I'm sure the score is going to be good. I don't know who's scoring Oppenheimer. Uh, Ludwig. Okay. Ludwig's scoring it. So it's going to have a good score. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, I, I just, I don't know a ton about this movie, but I, I know what I need to know, which is Christopher Nolan's directing it, and it's a Christopher Nolan movie, and it's it's gonna be, I'm at least gonna enjoy it visually, and I hope the story is equally as good. So that's why I put that one on my list. It's kind of, I'm a simple man. I see Christopher Nolan, and I go to the I go to the theater to see it. Fair enough. Um, yeah, Ludwig's got uh, returning lieutenant, um, defeated on Zimmer. It was the, the majority of Nolan's movies, but uh, Tom Zimmer is returning for Dune Part Two. That was his like big passion project. While he passed on Tenet, was to do the original Dune. Um, so he's continuing his work there, and Ludwig's continuing his collaboration with Christopher Nolan. Um, Corey, you also had Oppenheimer at number three. Probably shouldn't have skipped you there. Um, why? Uh, Based on, we're kind of going in like a uh, like a staggered fantasy. order. Yeah, um, Corey, why did you have it at three? Um, again, because it's you know Christopher Christopher Nolan's next movie. Um, I'm also really excited to see Cillian Murphy um, in the in the starring role in a film. Um, can't really think of the last time I really have seen that. Maybe twenty twenty eight days later. Um. He always plays great supporting characters. Um, he's a fantastic actor. And I think he was casted really well in this. So I think I'm just very excited to see his his take and how he carries the film. Um, and it also seems like the movie is going to be quite different than a lot of the movies that we've had from him, at least lately, Nolan. Um, seems like it's going to be more of a drama. It's not like an action movie, really. I mean, I'm sure there's going to be action, but not that same type of action that we're used to seeing. Um, so I'm excited to see, you know, something a little bit different from him. Because uh, I know, like, one of my favorite movies from him is The Prestige, and that's very different from mo- anything that he's done. So I think this could end up being, like, more of a return to form for him. You know, for like general audiences, people that really, you know, enjoyed some of his films, but not maybe necessarily all of them. So we'll see. Um, And I want to see the special effects that he does in this, like the practical stuff. That's what I'm really interested in, because he always does wild things regarding that. Yeah, this one was right outside of my top five. Um, It'll be interesting to see how it does box office wise. It doesn't have an immediate hook. 
like a lot of his films have no. over the past no almost 20 years um the one that really didn't have a hook was the prestige and that was his lowest grossing post batman begins um it's really like an an adult drama um and i mean this one's a, a biopic so uh but based on the fact that he still is going using all these practical effects and things like that there will be explosions that there will be loud booms um it is filmed in IMAX cameras. It's still going to be epic in scope. I imagine it'll still be um, a pretty big hit. I mean, Tenet was, uh, was it would have been interesting to see what that one would have done box office wise had it not come out. Yeah, that was the one that he was like, in 2020. No COVID. Yeah, exactly. Early in COVID, even. Um, that yeah, was, it August, was very early 20, in COVID. August 2020. Um, so. one wanted to save movie theaters. Exactly. Um, but yeah, I mean, he's been on a, a roll since uh, The Dark Knight, um, box office wise. Uh, so yeah, I'm hyped for Oppenheimer. Um, so yeah, both of you had. This is a classic had... movie. This is a classic yeah. movie that I would draft and it would make like. Ten million dollars. <laughs> no, it, no, because it's Christopher Nolan. Yeah, this and movie is. Yeah, that's make, the only reason. He is the biggest name. Uh, the he'll big, make. He is the biggest brand name director um, working. Yeah. Um, I'd say it's him, then Tarantino if he has a big actor in his movies, and then Scorsese if Leo's in it. Um, those are like probably I would say the three most bankable directors. Um. And but two of them Outside are of Cameron, of course. Two of them. Oh, sorry, you you are so fucking correct. Um, <laughs> yes, outside of James Cameron. Cameron's like on his own level <laughs> in his yes. own place. His name, like, which you don't think, like, like you would when people talk about like film directors, you don't like throw out James Cameron's name. Like film nerds don't throw it out like the way they do those other directors I just named. Um, but yeah, with the, the mass. With the masses, yes, James Cameron, far away. And then Christopher Nolan. Um, okay. Uh, so, yes, Doug, you had Oppenheimer at three as well. Um, so we'll get to my number three pick. Uh, it is Indiana Jones and the Dial of Destiny. Uh, I'm hoping for a full return to form um, for Indiana Jones in his swan song. I did not find upon a bunch of rewatches over the past year uh, kingdom of the crystal skull to be as bad as people consider it to be. I think it was ultimately um, a victim of internet culture and some very poor decision-making um, in certain areas on Steven Spielberg and George Lucas's part indifference. I think on Steven Spielberg's part, poor story decisions on George Lucas's part. Um, but with James Mangold coming into the fray, um, some new writers. Um, I think we got a chance for a really exciting final chapter in uh, indie story. Um, excited for the aging of Harrison Ford for certain select scenes. Um, see him fighting Nazis again. Haven't seen that since uh, the eighties. So, I mean, we didn't see it until VHS um, <laughs> for our time. Um, Crystal Skull is the only one we ever got to see in theaters on first run crazy to think that's already 13 years ago it's a similar situation or it'll be 14 years it's kind of a similar situation to avatar and avatar 2 um but yeah i'm just excited for uh to see harrison ford and i mean this is probably the last big action film he'll ever do where he's returning as one of his iconic characters yeah but yeah. uh if, unless anyone else has anything to add about indy we can move on to number two. I think it was so. I, I think Indy probably had a shot of making my top five. If it wasn't for the the trailer, just didn't do anything for me. I didn't, I didn't really like the the look of the trailer, so I, I think that's what's got me a little bit pessimistic. But I mean, it's only one trailer, so it could. could but yeah, I mean, it'll be really interesting. I'm still excited about that movie. Well, the next film which is number two on both mine and your list, Doug, had a killer trailer. One of my favorite trailers, maybe of all time. I've rewatched this one a lot. 
and <laughs> it is Guardians of the Galaxy Volume Three. Um, I'll let you start the conversation about it. Yeah, I mean, this was a movie that I was definitely anticipating because it, it's the final chapter in the Guardians of the Galaxy, I guess, trilogy of these characters, which I which I think is interesting, and it's James Gunn finally coming back after the whole Disney controversy that he, he had and that ultimately set a path for him, you know, <laughs> so funny. running the DC universe over at Warner Brothers, um, which is, yeah, it seems like that worked out actually pretty well for him. It worked out for uh, him, it worked, out for D, it worked out for DC. I mean, Marvel's fine. Marvel. Yeah. Marvel's Marvel, but yeah, it worked out tremendously in the long run for james gunn yeah he still that... got to finish guardians yeah, exactly and and he's now running dc so yep. seems like that that went pretty well for gunn um but yeah i was excited for it i got really excited for it though like you said the trailer looks awesome it was just like such a well put together trailer um interested to see you know it seems like there's gonna be a lot of focus on rocket and rocket's backstory um, and where Rocket ultimately goes into the, goes, um, which I think is going to be really interesting. I think that's a character that they haven't they haven't focused too much on, like why he is the way he is, and I think that could make a really interesting that could be a really interesting focal point of the movie. Bradley Cooper's, you know, going to do a great job with the voice acting. He's always been good um, on that front. And then, but yeah, I mean, this is primarily a trailer that you know just looked really freaking good. The music that they paired with it was great as always. I'm sure it's going to be a great soundtrack. I mean, there's just, I'm just, this is definitely, out of, out of all things Marvel, this is by far the highest thing on my list. Same. Um, just because it's, it's it looks it looks the best. So it's just hopefully such a it delivers. Labor of love but, for him. You can yeah. just get him, the cast, it just like, I don't know music. what it is. Yeah, it's just all. Everything is just done in such a way with such purpose. Um, I, was, I was reading that uh, James Gunn said he spent twice as much time coming up with the songs for the Volume 3 soundtrack as he did for the first two volumes combined. Um, right. Just because the fact that uh, Star-Lord has uh, Zune in this, it opens up the the amount of time that music can have come out that he's listening to it's not sure. limited strictly to music that his mom would have listened to but things going up all the way to the uh early i guess around 2005 probably mm -hmm. and music seems like it's such a big part of like james gunn and who james gunn is like he's he entwined it a lot in this in the Guardians of the Galaxy series, obviously, because he's made it such a big part with like the di the pl the disc player that um, or the Walkman that um, mm -hmm. Star Lord had. But I mean, even just watching um, the hell was that? Show? What was that stupid TV show that we all liked? Um, what was that? Peacemaker. <laughs> Yeah, Peacemaker. Like even like Peacemaker it had John Cena. It had like a music actually wound up being like a decent part of that show. Yeah. So the Suicide tell, like, Squad also had some yeah. uh, some big music scenes. Mm -hmm. So just music is a big part of like James Gunn and so it's really cool how he just kind of you can kind of feel his love for music when you watch these movies. Yeah, and what I'm really hyped for is the fact that this can be the first great Marvel Well, yeah, Marvel and Marvel and MCU trilogy. We have yet to get a great Marvel or like all of Marvel's history since mm -hmm. Blade. Um, or if you want to count any of those other things that came out beforehand um, or anything in the MCU, like we haven't gotten a great trilogy yet. Um, we've gotten close to it. We've gotten like three out of four when it comes to Avengers, but Ultron was kind of a letdown. Um, for me, Captain America one, I think is on a complete, a completely different level than two and three. Um, Iron Man really shit the bed after the first one. Uh, Thor is a, a weird four parter. Where, <laughs> um, <laughs> you know, everyone's opinions on that series is kind of mixed, but uh, I yeah. guess the best overall, uh, well, I guess probably the best MCU trilogy so far has been Spider Man. 
And yeah, probably the best overall Sony or overall Marvel trilogy has been Raimi's trilogy. I would take Raimi's trilogy over the web trilogy. Um, but yeah, I'd say those two are probably the best. Um, and then in all of superhero, I would say Nolan's trilogy is the best. But this like this has a chance to be up there with Nolan's as like well, like a the the top superhero comic book trilogy, mm-hmm. uh, based on how good, in my opinion, the first two films are. <clears throat> yeah, no, I agree. What, what's nice about the Guardians movies is they don't also feel like they're doesn't feel like there's a lot shoved in to try to build up to something else like for the most part they're allowed to kind of do their own thing yep yep yep. and that just kind of like makes it more enjoyable (laughs) but it's just like with all these tv shows and everything else like just kind of building to something else building to something else it's kind of nice that they're just kind of off somewhere in the galaxy kind of doing their own thing yeah they're very much contained except for the first one did i mean it had some it was how thanos got kicked off and everything like that yeah yeah Two was very much kind of its own thing. Thanos is the one outlier, but he plays such an important role in Gamora and Nebula's story. Yeah. Um, I mean, for you to get the complete Guardian story, you do have to watch Infinity yes. War and Endgame. Yeah. Um, you can skip Love and Thunder because their scene was a joke. was mm-hmm. probably the worst part of Love and Thunder um, and how misused the characters were and how sh- quickly they were shoved aside. Um, but yeah, otherwise, like they've just told their story in fantastic fashion since the moment they were introduced, and they kind of feel like their own little unit, their own little section of the MCU that's just worked out beautifully. Do and I, this is a question just since we're on Guardians, do you think that I mean, we're gonna see more Guardian stuff without James Gunn after this? I, uh, that. I imagine we will. Um, yeah. We'll it'll be different guardians, or some maybe some role some will carry over. I mean, we know we're not getting Batista back as yeah. Drax. Yeah. He's made it clear that this is the end for him. Mm-hmm. Um, it seems like some characters will die, and when it comes to the Guardians films, they've been with the well. They use a little bit of a loophole to have Gamora back, but mm-hmm. they've stayed true with Yondu dying. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, I imagine some will, some will still play a part in the MCU. Um, while others, this will be their swan song. And yeah, and Corey, you also had this on your list. So anything else that you want to add by all means? Um, no, I mean, I'm just excited to see, uh, James Gunn return to these characters because you could just tell like i mean he did a great job in suicide squad he's great with writing these type of ensemble characters uh films but these characters are so like you could tell like so close to his his heart that giving him getting the opportunity to finish that story that he started is going to be i think something really special absolutely All right, uh, well, let's get into your number two film, uh, most anticipated film, uh, which we just got a trailer for yesterday. Yeah. Um, Ari Aster's new film, Bo is Afraid, starring Joaquin Phoenix. Yeah, I've been I've been following this this film since uh, they announced it as uh, Desperation Boulevard. I think that's what it was called originally. That was the yeah. working title. Uh, Dis- Disappointment, Disappointment Boulevard. Boulevard? Something yeah, like that. It. But um yeah, since last year when they when they filmed it, when they started filming it, and uh, finally getting this trailer, um, it it's very hard to explain. I mean, it's definitely like a horror element type of dark comedy. Um, it has some. It seems to have some adventure uh, elements to it, but it follows uh, Walking Phoenix's character, I guess, throughout his life. Um, you see aspects of when he's a teenager. I'm assuming when he's even younger too. Um, all the way up to when he's an adult and, you know, elderly. And it follows, seems to follow the life of, I think he's just a neurotic, uh, neurotic type of individual with some, you know, issues. Uh, And, I mean, that's basically what the trailer showed. And it just seems so surreal and so unique. 
um, and different from what we've gotten from Aster before. Um, his movies have definitely been more like horror. Uh, Hereditary was very much traditional horror. Um, Midsummer had horror elements, but not necessarily a horror movie, I don't think. Um, it's more of like a fantasy film, uh, fantasy horror. And then this seems to have our horror elements, but I don't really know how far it's going to go. It's probably going to be something completely different too, which has me excited. Um, again, written and directed by Aster. Uh, and to have an actor like Phoenix starring in it, it, I'm like really excited. The rest of the cast that I didn't really know about until yesterday is pretty stacked. You got Nathan Lane, Parker Posey, Amy Ryan. Um, I think Michael Gandolfini is in it as well. Okay. So uh, I think it definitely it's on my list as number two because I'm just like super pumped for his, you know any of his movies, and I think this one could be a breakout for him. All right. Well, I didn't watch. Or I wasn't a fan of Midsummer, but I've never. I might watch Hereditary tonight because um, I've never seen it. Um, I did see the Bo's Afraid trailer. I didn't. It was one of those trailers where you like can't really yeah get like what exactly the plot is yeah, uh, lo- no. certainly looks visually like intriguing um and walking phoenix you know he's gonna kill it um but uh yeah i might give her a terry shot tonight um i'm kind of like so tired that like it might like make it even like more fucked up for me because from what i yeah. hear it's incredibly fucked up it is um, yeah, it's a fucked up movie all right. Performances are really good too. I mean, the performances are always really good in his movies so far. Um, but that one specifically, Tony well, Collette's great. Hereditary is kind of one that you kind of have to see again because only after the movie ends do you really understand mm. what was happening. Yeah, yeah that makes right. sense. Okay. Interested yeah. to see what you what you think if you do watch it. Yeah, but yeah, Tony Collette is like crushes that role. Mm-hmm. We'll certainly let you know if I uh, go through with it tonight. Um, and then, Corey, your number one pick was Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 3, which we already covered. Um, I'll go back to my number one because we've already talked about it as well. It was Killers of the Flower Moon, which, as I said, was number one for me last year. And then, Doug, for your number one, it is a film that was on your list last year. <laughs> last year. You had it as number one, but it was titled Spider-Man Across the Spider-Verse Part 1. Now it is number one, and it is strictly Spider-Man Across the Spider-Verse. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> for all the same reasons I was looking forward to it last year, um, Spider-Man Into the Spider-Verse is one of my all-time favorite superhero movies of all time. I love that movie. I think it captures perfectly... Um, you know, it's the one of the best versions of a super. I mean, we've seen a super, uh, the origin story of so many superheroes. I think Spider Man's a Spider Verse crushes the origin story with the whole leap of faith concept. Um, Miles is such a likable character, the voice acting across the board is great. Peter B. Parker is hilarious. I'm excited he's gonna be back. Um, because he was uh, one of the standouts, I think. Um, and the animation's great, the music's great. I mean, this movie's gonna cry. I would be surprised if this isn't one of my favorite movies of 2023, um, just because it has a lot going for it. I don't know that it'll live up to the incredibly high standards of the first movie, but even if it doesn't, um, I think it's still probably, you know, even if the fraction is good, I'm still gonna enjoy it. So, yeah, um, I have this so high because I'm expecting all of it. Yeah, I guess my only concern with those is, is it different writers or, or directors? Uh, I think, think it's it, different writers. I think it's the same. I think it's director. different writers too. Okay, I thought it was different directors. Um, I thought it was the same directors, but I I could be wrong. But the trailer looks phenomenal. Looks as innovative and um, beautiful as the last one. Certainly something I'm going to see in 3D. Um, I've talked about how Into the Spider-Verse was my favorite 3D experience. 
even post Way of Water, I would still say Into the Spider Verse is my favorite three D film. Um, wow! So I will absolutely be seeing this one in three D. Are you looking up the directors and writers of the two? I was trying to. Um, I don't know why I'm failing. Oh, I put oh. Spider Man across. This, but yeah. let's do some research. <laughs> And yeah, the reason why research, um, right? it was part one and part two, they switched it to, I think it's um, the third one is now called uh, Beyond the Spider-Verse, if I'm not mistaken. Makes sense. Didn't they say that they, and I could be just thinking of every movie where they go from a part one to part two to their own solo movies, but didn't they say that they thought it was a complete story and that's why they... I think that was part of the reason as well. So the writers of the first one were Phil Lord and Rodney Rothman. Rothman. Okay. And the writers of the second are Phil Lord, Chris Miller, and David Callahan. That so it's got one of the same writers. Um, the yeah, direct- Phil Lord was listed first on this on the first one, which means it, I think that means he wrote the majority of or more of it than Rodney Rothman, yeah. the second person, right? He was also the story. Um, was Phil Lord. Um, and then the directors of the first movie were Bob uh, Perse- Percy Shetty, Peter Ramsey, and Rodney Rothman. And the re- directors of the second are uh, Joaquin Dos Santos, Kemp Powers, and Justin K. Thompson. So there's a lot of differences complete. in both yeah. on both uh, fronts. But uh, Phil Lord is your one... Um, person involved constant. in both yeah, yeah, the, yeah. The constant um but hey bring chris miller into the fold that that's got to that should only help mm-hmm. uh, with, with the writing as well um awesome yeah hyped for it uh but yeah that's our top uh top five um Hopefully well, nothing winds up being on my most anticipated list of 2024. That was on my 2023 <laughs> I, list. I think we're done with that for now. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. That keeps feeling like the famous last <laughs> words that we say. And then <laughs> the next year comes and I'm going to be like, I think Spider-Man's coming out this year, guys. Yeah, exactly. next year, <laughs> we've finally caught up with, you know, all of these delayed well, films. Yeah. And, uh, Once Quantumania comes out, it's kind of a steady stream for the rest of the year with movies coming out on a weekly basis. Um, we just got to make it to mid February. Uh, all right. A lot of superhero movies that we didn't have. I mean, granted, we had some superhero movies, but we're growing Day, up. Had... We're growing up. <laughs> we're either growing up think... or we have superhero fatigue. It's one of the two. I think we I didn't get superhero fatigue, yeah, but like Quantumania is not on there. You got sh- the Shazam sequels coming out this year that no one's. Seems hyped for um, the new uh, Aquaman movies coming out this year. Yeah, you, did you say so the Marvels? There, there's a lot. The Marvels is coming out this year. Yeah. yeah. The thing with Quantumania is like, I mean, I've told you, you guys, this the the first trailer was was garbage, and the second trailer just came out, and like, I'm excited now after seeing that trailer, but up until this point, no. Yeah, like, if we had done a top ten like last year, I think we would have gotten a few more of those movies in there. Yeah, um, but as a top five, while our that we have the, almost all of our movies are franchises. The only originals we had were Oppenheimer and Killers of the Flower Moon and Bo's Afraid. Um, we were just very consistent on what our franchises were in Guardians of the Galaxy, Dune. Um, well, really, there's those two. Um, then I had Mission Impossible, Indiana Jones, and Doug, you had Spider-Man. Um, Corey, you Flash, had Flash, I guess, if you're counting. And the true and the Flash. Yeah, so you had you had three superhero movies actually. All right, and then Corey, you had three originals. Um, so cool. Um, so Corey's the most cultured out of the three of us. Yeah, <laughs> All right, it's a, it's a very different than last year's top ten. <laughs> Um, <laughs> last year we had a lot of horror also involved, and not one yeah. horror movie this year. Yeah. Um, <laughs> that's because it was right after Scream came out. Otherwise, it would I had already seen it. Otherwise, that would have been absolutely my top ten last year. Oh yeah, you didn't have the new Scream movie on here on your list. I didn't. It would be in my top ten. 
Um, okay. No, ne- no, Nev Campbell absolutely like lowers my wow. anticipation. Yeah. Um, Samara Weaving adding coming to it does brings it up a little bit, but uh, and lack of Nev Campbell hurt hurts my anticipation. Um, while still being very excited for it. Yeah. Uh, let's do TV, but let's do it in a straightforward manner. Um, Corey, just go through your five to one. Uh, number five, I have Perry Mason. Um, I completely forgot about this until earlier when we were uh, reviewing everything. Um, this the first season I really liked. Um, and you know the second season, I'm looking forward to seeing more of you know Jonathan Rice. I think that's his name. Uh, play Matthew, Matthew Reese. Matthew Wright. Matthew Reese. Sorry. Um, more Perry Mason mysteries, you know, in that in that time frame. So that one I'm looking forward to. Um, I had Righteous Gemstones as four, which uh, Danny McBride's uh, newest crazy insane HBO comedy, uh, following you know televangelist family um so i'm looking forward to getting a season three for that um shrinking which is a drama with um harrison ford and um trying to think of his name jason siegel i I believe it's a comedy is it it's from bill it's from bill lawrence and brett goldstein of ted lasso okay so i'm pretty sure it's a comedy or a dramedy um so i this, didn't see the, i didn't see the trailer though right and the trailer that i saw just as um to add to this was very much a teaser but it was a very interesting teaser and it showed a bunch of the cast that i was like oh wow this this looks like this could be really good so yeah, i wasn't really a, sure a, if it was a drama or a comedy it's Plenty a cool. comedy okay yeah so it's from roy kent uh bill lawrence co-creator of yeah. um well Roy Ken, a.k.a. Brett Goldstein, um, Bill Lawrence, um, co-creator of Ted Lasso, and Jason Siegel. So the three of them created it. Yeah, that I'm definitely, definitely really excited for. Um, and then uh, the next thing that I have on my list is um, True Detective Night Country, season three of the show, New Case. Season four. Um, season four, sorry. Uh, okay. with, um, uh, Jodie Foster, Jodie Foster. Yeah. Jodie yeah. Foster is going to be in it. She's going to be starring in it. I forgot if they, I don't know if they, they released any other cast members, but, um, it's going to follow another, I don't think any big names. Yeah. Um, new mystery, uh, probably a new part of the, I don't know, new part of the country I'm assuming. So uh, that'll be really interesting. I'm really excited for that. And then number one I have is Last of Us, which premieres on Sunday, I believe. Uh, yep. Looking forward to this one for a long time. Uh, Pedro Pascal, Bella Ramsey. Um, it's uh, Chris Metzen's new new show from Chernobyl um, based on the video game. So really, really excited for this. This one also is kind of catching me off guard with the reviews that I've been seeing. It's seems to be unanimously unanimously really good so i'm even more excited for this nice um yeah last of us i took off my list last minute um to swap in the righteous gemstones which uh, is fair you talked about um just because righteous gemstones i'm gonna be getting something completely new and Mm -hmm. last of us i've played the game multiple times i ultimately know what i'm gonna get out of the story um but i'm still super hyped for it um doug getting into yours i'm just going to mention about your number five pick true detective night country something that's interesting about that this one is it's a completely new um creator yeah like the showrunner writer uh, oh i didn't even realize that nick pizzalo is a lot not involved not involved now yeah his contract ended so it's a new creator interesting yeah i mean that has me a little bit cautious about it i so yeah, like you said, this is number five on my list. Uh, I think Jodie Foster being back is interesting. HBO has just been on a tear with TV. Um, they seem to, you know, be able to really spot good television series, and so I have a lot of faith that HBO is gonna, you know, hit out of the park with this one too. I don't know a lot about the new writer director, Neither do but I. the concepts sound interesting. That it takes place in Alaska, and they're trying to find missing men. 
having Jodie Foster in this detective type role, kind of similar to Silence of the Lambs, um, just sounds really interesting. And so that's why I had on my list. But yeah, I mean, I'm a little cautious of the fact that the original creator isn't back. Um, you know, I guess he had a misstep for a lot of people with season two. I thought season three was great. Um, yeah, it was a huge rebound, but yeah, not a lot of people watched it because season two, I think a lot of pe people fell off. So it was unfortunate because Mahershala it. Lee, yeah, Mahershala Lee was great. And I thought the story was really good. So, um, and season three wound up being my favorite season. So it sucks that they didn't get them back. But <laughs> Same with me. You know, you liked it more than one. Wow. Oh, interesting. Yeah. So hopefully, hopefully it's good, but, um, I think, now, where did you say that four you, takes place? Alaska is where oh. it's to take place. They're filming in Iceland, I believe, but it takes place in Alaska. Cool. Yeah. So, um, I guess there's, there's kind of a theme in my list that I'm noticing. <laughs> and, um, the theme is my faith in, well, maybe it isn't a theme. <laughs> okay. You may or may not have a theme. There's no theme. Okay. Uh, yeah, I, I thought I thought this was an HBO Max or an HBO movie or, or TV show, but it's not. So I put I have number four on my list is the three body problem, and that's um, it's the showrunners um, from Game of Thrones that are involved in this movie. But I guess looks like it's Netflix. So yeah, they had yeah they, they had that in. mega they had the mega deal with Netflix, which that's made right. Them stop doing the Star Wars. Is this based on a book movies. It is based on a book. It's a pretty popular sci-fi book. Yeah. Um, I think originally China is where mm -hmm. the book came out. Yep. Um, I picked this primarily because of the it's the creators of the Game of Thrones TV show. Yes, I didn't love it after season four, and, but I believe this book is done. And I thought uh, Benioff and Weiss did the creators of Game of Thrones did a really good, great job adapting source material. And so um, I just have a lot of faith that they're going to do a good job adapting what a lot of people are considering to be good source material with this three body problem. Yeah. I've heard good. So that's why I have it on the list. Yeah. So that's why I made my list sucks. It's on HBO. Cause then I could have had more HBO shows and had a theme <laughs> for my list, but whatever. Um, Number three on my list was Loki. Um, out of all the Marvel TV shows, this is probably one of my top. I think it's probably might be just below WandaVision, although I think probably the show worked better for me overall than WandaVision did as a whole. Mm. WandaVision had the higher highs and lower lows for me. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, Loki's, it's fun. I'm, I have no idea where they're going to go with the show based on how it ended. And um, where we left off with the king, the king of it all. Um, so I'm really interested to see where it goes, but Tom Hiddleston's great. Um, Owen Wilson, I, I really like that pairing. So I'm excited to see more of it. I'm hoping we get more, you know, um, Alligator Loki and like some of those kind of off the wall characters still as we kind of bounce around this really unique story. Um, so that's my number three. Uh, number two is The Last of Us. I mean, I don't... I guess I, I could have gone probably either way with number two and number one. Because The Last of Us is... I'm looking forward to that movie so much. I feel like Sunday can't get here fast enough. Or that TV show. Um, just because... You know... I, one, I love... You know, I'm looking forward to those HBO Sundays again where I get to... I have something awesome to watch every Sunday and look forward to. But I get to re... I get to relive the game through the performances of... Um, people I'm blanking on their names. Uh, but Nelly. I get to relive all... Yeah. But I, I get to relive the... I get to relive the game, but I don't have to do anything. I get to kind of sit back and watch this world be created... Uh, the trailers look awesome. Looks like a pretty faithful. Ad you get to experience it the way your wife experienced it. Yeah, exactly. One, <laughs> one thing that I think is very interesting about Last of Us, even though it's a, I think it's nine episodes show, um, the episodes are very long. Like episode one is like an hour and a half. Do we know it's a? Is it adapting the entire first game? Do we know that yeah, for a fact? 
Yes. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, we we know where it's going. I heard it sounded like they're going to pull in like the the part of the game that they're doing the, left the behind cool stuff, the yeah. left behind stuff, and they're expanding on a lot of stuff that they really couldn't do in in a game. Uh, yeah, which is neat. Like I think that Ellie's relationship and the left behind gets explored more. And it's yeah. like from the the show. Same with so uh, that makes... the character of Bill. Um, they elaborated yeah. that he like had a boyfriend, and I know uh, it's uh, mm-hmm. Murray Bartlett from who played Armand in White Lotus, and Nick Offerman's Bill. Uh, so okay. that should be that should be. Uh, I mean, they're two fantastic actors. Yeah, I mean, I all the actors that they have for the show are great. The um, the the creators behind the show are great. The, the fact that they've got um, Neil Druckmann involved, heavily involved in this, is a good sign. I mean, everything points to this being good. The reviews point to it being good. A lot of people are saying this is the best video game ad- adaptation, which it's, it's not, not a high what bar. Does that mean? <laughs> <laughs> me, me not including this is like me not including the Batman on my top ten anticipated next year. <laughs> like I know it's gonna like be high on my best of list next year. Yeah. But for and I'm fucking really you just want to be a contrarian. I part of me just yeah, we just wanted to do something a little, a little different. Yeah. Yeah, I'm just like the fact that I keep like being like, is this the weekend that, or is this the week that Last of Us comes out? Like, when's the Last of Us coming out? Like, I've felt that way now for like several weeks. Yeah, the week. But you like, you make I, a good point, Doug. Like having anticipating those like HBO Sundays again. I mean, you and me had that with uh, you know House of the Dragon recently. Um, Murph, I'm with, sure uh, Murph, Murph and I with White Lotus. Yeah, exactly. I didn't watch White Lotus yet, but um, it, it's that's always something exciting to look forward to because Sundays are usually like kind of lame because, you know, you have to go back to work the next day and the weekend for people that work Monday through Friday jobs. So um, that's going to be, you know, a treat to have for the next nine weeks. Yeah, I'm super excited about it. HBO is just crushing it for me right now. Yes. Um, and then Severance feels like is my number one. And it feels like it should be an HBO into- show, but it's not. It's on Apple. Um, but I just that that show caught me off guard uh, with how good, how much I enjoyed it. Uh, it's quirky. It's got sci-fi. Um, thought the acting all around was pretty good. I have no idea where they're gonna go with the second season. It's got one of the. It's got a really strong uh, cliffhanger, or uh, to the first season and set up for season two that I'm really excited about. I mean, this is a show that I just binged through um, when I had COVID a while back. Um, and I just kind of had to keep, keep, keep hitting play um, just because <laughs> I just, I was really enjoying this one. And so um, really excited to see where it goes, but I, I just think this is, this was kind of a sleeper show for me. I didn't expect to like it as much as I did. And it was probably one of my favorite shows last year. All right. Yeah, no, this is one that I still need to catch up on. Um, and will at some point. Shame. Uh, probably around the time season two comes out, similar to how I'll catch up with uh, House of the Dragon around the time season two comes out, comes out. But at least I caught up to Andor. Did that. So that was yeah, one thing. here. One Took down. me a while. <laughs> we will uh, yeah. likely talk about Andor in our next episode when talking about our best of 2022. Um, it took like every week being like, you should watch Andor. <laughs> it happened. That's what matters. Um, I was getting attacked from all angles. Family members like, you got to be watching Andor. I'm like, I know. Doug tells me all the time. I need to be watching Andor. Um, but all right. We'll go to my top five. Uh, number five, uh, Loki, which was on your list, Doug. Um, with this one, I, I was between uh, this or Secret Invasion. Um for as like the MCU show to make it. Those are like the only two that I'm really looking forward to this year. Um, I thought the secret invasion trailer and the cast is just, it's pretty, pretty promising looking and the cast is stacked, but ultimately I went with Loki because we've already seen season one and I know how strong the show has been. 
Um, so that was my reason for that i like the cliffhanger and ended on so excited to see where things go from there uh number four already mentioned it righteous gemstones uh, i just one of the best comedies on television at this point in time um each of the danny mcbride jody hill shows get better um than the previous one i think it's fair to say um assuming this stays on the same path um it can likely be better than vice principles um but it, yeah it's a blast Totally recommend it to anyone, anyone who has who's even watched like one of them in the past and didn't like it. This one has so many characters that it can make you like it, despite the fact that you might not like Danny McBride, like you, like his type of comedy. Um, there's just so much variety with because of John Goodman, Adam Devine, um, Edie Patterson, Walton Goggins, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, there's some. You will find something funny on this show. Uh, number three for me is Barry. Um, Bill Hader's fourth season um, will be coming out probably late this year, if I had to guess. I know they've just wrapped filming. Um, spoiler alert to my best of 2022 shows, but Barry was high on my list. So based on the way it ended um, and how strong, yeah, basically just, on how strong I thought season three was thought it was the best the show's been so far. Um, and it ended in a way where it's potentially be game changing. Um, had to have it high on this list. And again, so excited to have good shows on HBO on Sunday nights, as you uh, both have mentioned. Number two is a revival. Um, so it has the potential to be fucking terrible. Um, but <laughs> the two seasons of it, that aired back in 2009 and 2010 were perfect every episode um nearly the entire cast is coming back and it's uh party down it was on stars it'll be returning to stars with a six episode limited run um we got adam scott jane lynch megan mullally martin star um kyle hansen uh, basically everybody oh uh, camarino uh basically everyone is back except for lizzie kaplan um, it's about a bunch of waiters that work in like party caterers, waiters, uh, bartenders that work in the Los Angeles area that all aspire to be something better, but they're in this shitty job. It's just super funny comedy. Um, Rob Thomas, who created Veronica Mars and Paul Rudd, they're both producers on it. Um, but yeah, the fact that this is coming back is a miracle considering the fact that the series finale of the show only had 13,000 viewers total. Oh my Thir God. 13,000. <laughs> and uh, I was one of them. Um, How did this get greenlit? Because of just people getting into it after the fact? People getting into it act after the fact and just the. So I haven't seen um, it. it. Yeah, people just the cast becoming more famous since. Like Adam Scott quit this show to go to Parks and Rec. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that was basically the nail in the coffin for the show. Um, but, uh, and Jane Lynch left season one to do Glee. So Meg Mullally came in, Jennifer Coolidge actually finished the last two episodes of season one because Jane Lynch had to leave early for Glee. She can't come back because White Lotus. Um, but, uh, my expectations are that it's going to be a ton of funny people and funny writers continuing to do funny stuff. And it's probably only going to be a little bit, it's going to be even more depressing while funny because these characters are now a decade older and still in the shame, same shitty jobs that they were in um, and wanted to be out of in the early, late 2000s, early 2010s. Uh, and my number one show um, is one that took the year off in 2022 and it is another HBO uh, show, this one a drama and it is Succession. Um, this at this now that Better Call Saul has ended, this is my drama. Um, my favorite drama that's on television. Um, super hyped for the return. Uh, it ended in a way, each season seems to end in the strongest possible manner to get you excited for the following season and shake things up with the power dynamics within this family and this company that they've built. Um, or that the Brian Cox's character has built, um, who is the Rupert Murdoch of the family. Uh, but you know it's going to be 
scathingly funny, brutal. The insults are going to be deep level um, while the drama will remain high um, and your investment in these deplorable characters um, will only continue to grow. I don't, I think the show will probably I think Brian Cox said he didn't, didn't want to go too long, like around like five seasons he thought would be appropriate. So if that is the fact, then we are approaching the end game and season four should be uh, one hell of a doozy. And Alexander Skarsgård's character is returning, um, I believe, as a regular. Um, and he was a nice addition to the show last season. So between all of us, we had a lot of HBO shows. And uh, there were probably there's plenty of others that we could have included, um, either coming back this year or then or ones taking the year off. Um, a Curb Your Enthusiasm, for example, coming back this year, Euphoria next year, Peacemaker, if I don't know. That's probably taking the year off. That's an HBO Max one. So, yeah, Gunn's got enough on his plate. <laughs> yeah, Peacemaker's probably not top of mind. Hopefully, he had the Peacemaker stuff written prior to this deal being made. <laughs> um, mm-hmm. Yeah, at some point we should probably do our rankings of HBO shows uh, because yeah. I think we would all have some unique lists, um, some crossover, but. Uh, the quality we know would be incredibly high for every show that would be on that list. Yeah, I'd like to force myself to watch Succession at some point. Um, you should. You'd eventually. You you would love it. Um, I mean, it, once you get into it. And it, 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 well, it wasn't far enough in, I guess, to not be able to easily walk away because I was able to like get distracted by something and not continue. It was, it was episode four or five that was uh, when the drama really hit. Um, yeah. and it wasn't so much the dark comedy and then it was just like, it's like this, okay, this shit's like exciting and dramatic at the same time that it's dark, dark comedy. So, Tokyo yeah. Vice is another good one. I still recommend. Is that one coming back this year or? E, uh, yeah, yeah. It's definitely, it got renewed. I, I'm pretty sure there's a second season this gotcha. year. I remember seeing it on something. Yeah, and then White Lotus and House of the Dragon. I imagine both of those will be back in 2024. So those Mm -hmm. would be on upcoming lists. Um, So yeah, that's that. That's our uh, most anticipated films and television shows of 2023. As of now, as we know, things can change. Um, But yeah, we will talk more about these ones and other uh, films and TV shows this year that we're excited about as the year goes on. Uh, that's all we've got for today. Thank you again for listening. Um, please follow us on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, um, and the various podcast networks um, that you can subscribe to. Um, next week, or not maybe not next week, but on our next episode, I think a few months I, from I, now. No, we'll, it'll be sooner. Um, we're on a, <laughs> we're on a strict at least two episodes a month. Um, so you are going to be getting at least what does that mean? Uh, Probably next 20, week. At least twenty six episodes from us this year um we gotta break it to 100 yeah yeah yeah. this year we'll do it if we do 26 we'll break it it. so we're doing a break it this year um but our next episode we we should all be caught up on everything all the films that we wanted to catch up on for 2022 so we'll talk about our favorite films and tv shows um of 2022 as we finish playing catch up perfect time too with all the awards season stuff going on golden globes awards just happened the screen actors guild nominees just came out county award nominations should be out uh in the next month or so so uh yeah perfect time to uh play catch up and uh let you know our thoughts about uh the year but as always this has been Corey doug murph at live breathe film and we will see you again next time film fans bye